Hi, this video comes from a question on the forum by a user named Stays, and he asks, should he save up for two months and buy the venerable DS1052E? Everyone knows it, it's been around for a long time, rock solid little scope. Or should he save up for four months, roughly pay a bit over double the price and get the new DS2000 series scope? And well, it's an interesting question. So I thought I'd do a quick video on the current state of the art in these budget scopes. How much scope do you get for basically the same money as the price that this was released at? Remember, the uh, DS1052E was not always <laughs> you know, under 400 bucks. It originally came out at that similar $800 price point. This one's official price is 839 US dollars. And you may not realize, but this one's actually five years old now. It came out in, uh, uh, sort of late-ish 2008, and it's still going. I mean, it's unbelievable. Five years for one of these um, base-level scopes, and it's an interesting question. Should you buy one of these, or is it worth paying double and getting one of these? Sure, it can be a bit more than double depending on your location and the international market and all that sort of BS, so it's an interesting question. Does this one offer double the value compared to this one, or double the bang per buck. Let's investigate. So how much has oscilloscope technology progressed in the last five years? Well, in fact, it's uh, less than five years because the uh, DS2000 series has been out for like uh, nine months now. So, you know, we're talking like four years, uh, four, four and a half years max technology difference between these two. Now the DS1052E doesn't really contain anything that the DS2000 doesn't have. So this video is going to be all about the additional features and capabilities on the DS2000 series over the DS1000E series. One of the biggest things is the display. Much bigger uh, display at 800 by 480 whereas this one is only 320 by 240 This one is uh, brighter though but Eh, no contest. They've upped the minimum uh, bandwidth to 70 megahertz from 50 megahertz in the 1000 series. We won't go into the differences with the hack and uh, stuff like that. Unfortunately, the bandwidth is not software upgradable in this thing, which is a bit of a bummer. And we've got two gig samples per second as opposed to one gig samples per second. Now, that uh, technically may not uh, matter much with uh, sine X on X interpolation, which both of these uh, units have. That technology hasn't changed, but this one has a uh, boxcar averaging feature or what they call the high resolution mode, which allows you to make use of that two gig samples per second. And we can see that high res mode here. If we go down, switch it on, it effectively gives you a greater resolution analog to digital converter. Modern scopes have that features, they didn't have it in these low end ones back then. One small difference is the probes. With the 1000 series, you only got the standard 100 megahertz passive probe. But with the 2000 series, you get the 150 megahertz passive probe as standard, even on the 70 megahertz model. And on the higher bandwidth model, you get the 350 megahertz passive probe. Excellent. And we have an anti-aliasing mode too. You can see this down here like this. So you can't alias like you can up here. I'm displaying a 10 megahertz signal on both of these. They're exact same time base, but look at the aliasing on this one. Absolutely horrible. Look at that. Oh, hopeless. You won't ever see that on the 2000 series. Big bonus. And we've now got 14 times the memory at 14 meg points. This one only had one meg points, which was phenomenal for its day. Absolute killer. But this is 14 times more with an optional software upgrade to 56 meg or 56 times more. And let's uh, stop both of these waveforms here. I've got, let's zoom in on this one. This is set to 14 meg points. Look at that. Beautiful, smooth. You can see all the detail in that. If we zoom in on the same waveform here with one meg points look at that it's just all crusty it doesn't have the memory depth capable of displaying that fine detail when you zoom in now in some cases this massive 14 meg point memory or 56 meg point memory is still not enough if you've got individual bursts like this separated by very large period very large time periods in the order of seconds for example you need gigapoints 
of memory on a traditional scope to actually sample it. But so these modern scopes have what's called segmented memory capability, aka waveform replay mode that it's called on this um, DS2000. That's what this control around here does, allows you to record and playback uh, seg captures of high resolution parts of the waveform separated by very long blank periods. So you aren't wasting all of your sample memory in all this dead period here. You're just capturing a little sh a snapshot there, a snapshot there. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. I've got a 100 kilohertz sine C waveform, 100 kilohertz main frequency there, separated by um, a not very low frequency. I've got it separated by one kilohertz there. So it's a one kilohertz burst with 100 kilohertz main frequency. And as you can see, I've got this scope set to 14 meg points and it's not capturing that properly because there's just not enough memory depth to do it. So if we change the time base up like that, we can see it. Now let's put on waveform capture mode. Here we go. We just press record here and check this out. It's going to record 8,000 of those waveforms. There we go. It's just, man, it's about to finish. There we go. It's just captured 8,000 of those. So now I can just replay through... You can't see that waveform uh, change much at all because I've, you know, it's the same signal going in. But let's say it did vary, you would actually see, you know, each capture of that waveform. It stored 8,000 waveforms. Brilliant feature. So depending on the uh, repetition rate of the waveform, we're talking about gigapoints of memory here. So this thing has stored 8,000 waveform captures of 14 points, uh, 14k points. Each. So even on the 14k points is enough to zoom in and see detail on that. A phenomenally useful feature. There we go. We'll record 500 uh, waveforms at uh, I think it's uh, 140k points each. And we can also do trace analysis or pass fail analysis. And we can go in there and we can set our mask as well. And what we can do is we can actually scroll through and select the waveform we want so we can go right to this uh, say 508 at the end here and we can create a mask from any frame that we've actually captured a pass fail mask brilliant so then what we can do is we can start an analysis of all the frames based on the pass fail uh, mask which we've set in there and it gives us the results down here of which particular frames failed so you can see it down there but you can go through and it actually analyzes each frame based upon the uh, the mask which you've uh, set up absolutely brilliant and then it gives you some stats 305 of those waveforms uh, failed to pass the mask um, out of 508 then we've got waveform update rate the DS2000 uh, specs it at a maximum of 50,000 waveforms per second, which is excellent. And uh, the DS1052E doesn't really specify it, doesn't have a trigger out uh, capability to enable you to, to directly measure that. Um, but it's in the order of like a couple of hundred waveform updates per second at best. And what I'm feeding in here is a little glitch. You can see it popping up here, no problems at all. I've got this set to 14 uh, K points, and this is also set to uh, short memory depth as well it's not set to one meg point because the waveform update rate changes with your memory depth as i'll uh, show you but look oh there we go we just caught it there maybe you just caught one there if you're lucky but this one just shows up the glitches all the time not a problem at all and if we increase that uh sample memory 140k points we're still picking it up not a problem with 140k and even at 1.4 meg points, we've still got enough waveform update rate to um, pick up all that and um, pick up those anomalies. You'll never ever see it on the Rigol, especially if you go up here and set the Rigol to a memory depth of long memory. You'll probably never see it up there. And here's the waveform update rate actually measured from the trigger output of this DS2000. There it is, 46 kilohertz or 46,000 waveforms per second. And um, of course that's going to vary with the uh, time base. There's only going to be certain uh, sweet spots on that time base relative to the um, input frequency that you're actually measuring where you're going to get um, you know, your full waveform update rate. But the same thing applies to uh, any digital scope including the 1000 series. So it's still in, real, in terms of real world use with uh, glitch capture and other aspects, streets ahead of the 1000 series, no question. 
And just look at the practical difference in this waveform update rate between the two. I've got just a simple sine wave on here modulated with some noise and look at the intensity graded display and the waveform update speed. You can see the clear detail in the DS2000 series down here. Look at that, absolutely beautiful. And if I change the memory depth, of course, that will uh, vary. So let's go 140k points. Here we go. 1.4 meg points, 14 meg points, 56 meg points. So as you can see on the uh, wave on the lower memory depths with the faster waveform update, even here you're getting more detail than you're getting on with uh, 1.4 meg points than you're getting with the short memory here. So if you compare the two, there's just really you know a massive amount of signal fidelity difference in here even when this thing's capturing um, large amounts of waveform data but look at that no contest and that brings us to intensity graded display which these modern uh, scopes have i.e the Tektronix DPO digital phosphor oscilloscope uh, technology Agilent have it all the major manufacturers have it and now it's in these um, you know, entry level scopes. Just look, I'm varying the intensity here and you can see the difference in that waveform. It's basically giving you an analog like display. So, this intensity grading of your display, it's working much more like an analog oscilloscope. And if you compare that to the 1000 series, which doesn't have intensity graded display, all you're doing is changing the brightness of the waveform. There is no detail in there, i.e. less frequent stuff is not um, any uh, display with any less intensity than more frequent stuff. So it's not an analog type display. It is just your traditional old school digital. No contest. Now something that shows up this analog-like intensity graded display quite well is an amplitude modulated sine wave. In this case I've got a 1 MHz sine wave, 120% amplitude modulated with a 100 Hz uh, sine wave and I've got both of them set to maximum brightness here. And as you can see, um, you know, you can see more detail in this one. They're both set to one meg point memory, by the way. So we're getting roughly equivalent um, there. But you can see the finer detail on the DS2000 because of the uh, better screen and everything else. But watch what happens if we turn the intensity down on this. Because it's an intensity graded display, you get the more frequent stuff highlighted brighter. Whereas if you do it on the 1000 it's just the one intensity that's it you don't get anything but it shows up beautifully on this DS2000 look at that absolutely beautiful and then if we increase the uh, memory depth as well look at that wonderful absolutely beautiful analog like display that's at minimum intensity right down there and we can turn that up and that's just, it works exactly like an analog scope. And if you don't believe me that it's just like an analog display, well, here it is on an analog oscilloscope. Look at that. We adjust the intensity like that. We adjust the intensity. And it's very, very similar at the slow time base. And let's take the time base all the way up, shall we? We've got to adjust our uh, trigger again. Bang. We'll take this time base all the way up, we'll adjust our trigger, and there it is, uh, zoomed in at the faster time base. Look at that, analog-like performance. Beautiful. And of course we can adjust the intensity on that to go all the way down, and we can do the same thing on the analog-like uh, display, but there you go. Beautiful. You do not get that on the older scopes without these intensity-graded displays. And at the exact same tie base on the Rigol DS2000, regardless of memory depth, you just do not get that at all. And the vertical range on this scope can go down to 500 microvolts per division. That is absolutely phenomenal. And I do hope that sends a new, uh, sets a new uh, trend in uh, low noise uh, front ends in oscilloscopes these days. Very few oscilloscopes uh, ever on the market have had 500 microvolts per division. And I'm generating a uh, 500 microvolt um, signal here from my Marconi uh, generator. There it is at uh, 10 megahertz. And 
look at that. Yeah, I've got averaging turned on, 64 averages. We can uh, turn that uh, all the way down. Eh, there you go, but 64 averages and the same 500 microvolt signal on the DS1052E. Of course, it's only got a minimum vertical range of 2 millivolts per division. And I've got 64 averages uh, set there as well. And they've both got hardware frequency counters built into them. Nothing changed there. Now, as for measurements, yeah, both of them can display um, a whole bunch of basic uh, waveform measurements. But the DS2000 goes far beyond that, right into the realm of statistics. What we can do is turn on statistics here and check out all these statistics which we can get along here. We can have five different statistics displayed at once, uh, controlled by both horizontal and uh, vertical stats menus with all these different options. VRMS, overshoot, pre-shoot, period, area, area, and that's just the vertical, the horizontal, if we go in there. We've got uh, frequency, rise time, all sorts of stuff. We can do phase delay between channels. And there's all the statistics counting up there. You can see that the various counts are going up. And, of course, this waveform's not uh, uh, changing much at all, so there's hardly any difference in there. But if we had a waveform that was, you know, significantly uh, changing, we would, you know, be able to see the current, the average, the deviation, and we can select in here the extreme uh, values or the difference. Phenomenal capability. And then you can actually get graphs of the statistics you've actually chosen and combine it with the uh, waveform replay or, or segmented memory feature. Incredible. And of course we've got the usual uh, FFT capability. We can go split screen here which is really nice or we can actually go full screen uh, combination of that and of course we can uh, scale that in various ways and we can select uh, different windowing types. And what we can do here is set up advanced ex math uh, expressions which allow us to do all sorts of stuff. Check it out. We've got uh, integrals, differentials, uh, logs, exponents, square roots, sine, cosine, tangent, variables, and we can do various um, arithmetic operators as well. In this case, I'm going to do the square root of channel 1. So if we apply that, then bingo, that is our square root of channel 1, the purple waveform there. And what we'll do here is we'll have a go at the uh, integral of channel 1. So we select integral, we select channel 1 there, we select close in brackets, that's our expression, and we apply that, and there's the integral of that waveform when you uh, scale it and position it correctly. Beautiful, and you can do that for advanced uh, expressions, channel 1, channel 2, combine them as well as uh, constants and all sorts of things. Fantastic. And there's been a big step up in the number of uh, trigger modes. All we had um, back then is edge, pulse, slope, video, and alternate. That's it. But on the DS2000, we have more than we can poke a stick at. Runt pulses, windows, nth edge, slope, um, pattern, delay, timeout, duration, set up and hold. And then we've got uh, the various serial protocol triggers as well. And I know the serial uh, decode features are optional extras, but... Hey, it's capability in a base level scope for uh, basic SPI and uh, I2C and RS-232 protocol decode. And you've got event tables and it's all there. And of course, with the large memory, you can capture huge expanses of data like that and then just uh, stop that and then zoom in on an individual packet like that. That's the advantage of the really deep memory, that uh, 14 meg instead of 1 meg. Now on an $800 class uh, entry level scope, we've got not only uh, trigger out, but um, that LAN capability built in as well with uh, LXI standard. Brilliant. Let's have a look at what we can do. So what I've done is connected my scope to the uh, Ethernet port on my laptop here, and I'm running software written by an EEV blog forum user called uh, Marmad, and he's written this awesome software which works with all the UltraVision uh, series scopes, not just the 2000 but the 4000 um, and the 6000 as well, I believe, and allows us to capture all of the uh, waveform captured data from the scope, all that segmented uh, record replay stuff, and then we can do various cool plots and analyze the data, export it, do all sorts of things. Fantastic utility. It's not written by Rigol, but it uses the uh, Visa um, LXI 
uh, interface. In this uh, case, I've installed the National Instruments uh, Visa driver in this thing, and uh, the software he's written just interfaces using the standard LXI uh, protocols, and it allows him to control the scope in, and extract all the frames of data out through all the memory and we can do various things with it as you'll see and I will uh, get a screen a proper uh, screen capture of this in a minute so what I've got is a slowly varying waveform on the scope and as you can see it's uh, corresponding in almost real time there it's actually telling us it's um, updating at six waveforms per second and that's the uh, speed that it's actually uh, doing here so it's not quite uh, real time but w what we'll do is we'll use the um, record feature of this and we'll plot this data on our sco on our uh, PC here it'll be fun watch this so as you saw there I had this waveform and I was modulating that at one hertz so you saw it actually changing live there I've recorded uh, 8128 um, frames of that or waveforms of 14k points each and we're going to be able to load all of that into this software it could uh, take some time to load all that data it's a massive amount of data it's got to transfer across the ethernet port and uh, import so what we can do here, there's various options, there's record up here and there's play uh, DSO and we can actually uh, save it back. I won't go into the full details here but let's just do an example of where we can save this frame array here and so let's just uh, save this and we'll call it test3 and we'll save it and what it's doing now is it's actually um, importing the data as you can see. 43 for frame uh, 50 uh, frame 70 there we go up to 100 and it's got to read all 8000 it doesn't have to we can actually stop it and we may actually uh, do that we may not let it go all the way but uh, as you can see while it's actually doing that there is you can see the data is it's replaying the data on the screen of the oscilloscope here and you can see it going up like that and it'll reach its peak and then it'll go back down so it's eventually reading all those recorded frames and then we're going to be able to get a very nice waterfall plot of this all right i'm actually going to uh, stop it there i'm up to frame 2500 i'm sure we'll have enough data to see the modulation so let's give that a go and we'll cancel that and check it out we now have it starting to plot a waterfall plot of that waveform versus frame so the frames like it started here this is like frame number one and then you can see the one hertz modulation on that frame it's probably not the best example it's not drawing the full line down there that's why it looks a bit uh, funny but this is a classic um, waterfall type plot and it's a great visualization tool to actually see this and you can't get this on the scope but to import the data and have a tool like this available in you know this sort of price range scope is just absolutely phenomenal so that's one of the great uses of uh, the Ethernet um, LXI interface you can write advanced software to control almost any uh, aspect of the scope and its operation so as well as that 3D waterfall type plot, we can also do a 2D uh, version of that and an intensity graded bitmap display too. So that's what we're going to do. Let's go for the intensity graded one and we'll plot that and get that out of the way. Oh, I can't drag that out of the way, sorry, but you can see it building up there to give us that intensity graded display. It's brilliant. So there you have it. There's a look at a five-year-old uh, sort of what I would consider entry-level uh, scope at that $800 price point and what you can get today for that same price point and it's I paid uh, around about the same price for my first 20 megahertz dual channel single time base um, analog uh, oscilloscope way back I don't know when I was a uh, teenager and now uh, when I bought this I paid about uh, 700 odd uh, dollars for this before the prices dropped and it was you know fantastic capability for its day five years ago this was absolutely incredible it sent set a benchmark with that uh, one gig uh, sample per second the one meg point memory real time had FFT and various uh, you know uh, other features which um, aren't too dissimilar to what is on any uh, modern scope five years later except 
take a look at what you can get now for the same money. There's just, the difference is absolutely incredible. There's practically no contest. Now, to answer the uh, original uh, poster's question on the forum, should he uh, wait, uh, save up for two months and buy this, or save up for four months and buy this? Well, I think you know my answer. Go for the, unless you absolutely cannot afford it, go for something like this modern feature set, Rigold DS2000 series. It's got an order of magnitude more features and performance as you saw and there's stuff which I didn't even not show I'm sure there's uh, uh, other little things in there that I've missed and things like that and if you want to point them out put it in the comments or on the forum this is what I would consider an entry-level feature set scope these days around about that eight that traditional sort of you know sub thousand dollar eight hundred dollar uh, price point whereas these are now uh, something like the DS1052E has sort of gone into the really ultra low cost bare bones sort of you know oscilloscope market it's you, yeah uh, you're arguing semantics is this entry level or is this entry level but of course if you only got 400 bucks then the point is moot really isn't it well you, you know you buy the ds1052e or one of the other um low cost uh scopes these days which do have more functionality than the 1052e uh typically and it'll serve you well they're a decent entry level scope but what i'm trying to say here is that the ds2000 represents the new benchmark in what i would consider entry level scopes at that more traditional 800 dollars price point because that $400 price point really you know didn't exist uh, five years ago you couldn't get any decent scope with any sort of you know decent usable capability for that sort of price so these uh, new modern ultra low cost scopes have really created a new category which hasn't really been available before so I'm absolutely blown away with the capability you can get for that sort of you know the same price I pay for my original 20 megahertz analog uh, all those decades ago and what will we have in five, another five years' time? What will be the uh, sort of, you know, the benchmark feature set? This is pretty much uh, the best bang for buck um, scope. You can get sub $1,000 on the market, bar none. This is a set the benchmark for modern feature set just like this one did five years ago. Oh, hope you enjoyed it, folks. It was a bit longer than I expected, but I wanted to demo uh, all of the individual features. So if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV blog forum. That's the best place to do it. And if you like this sort of video, please give it a big thumbs up or two thumbs up. I don't think you can do that. I think you can only give one thumbs up on YouTube. Bummer. Catch you next time.